Hi, welcome to the bathtub, where when you hear this sound effect, we are number one. We are number one. And you see this uh, ringy dink statue, you know it's time for another uh, internationally renowned episode of the bathtub, which we like to call the All Bathtub Hall of Fame. Every month or two months or so, some lucky guy or girl who's dead probably receives this uh, a glimpse of this extremely cheap trophy and they become elevated to the upper ranks of bathtub excellence these are people who have wasted more water than i don't know than the atlantic ocean or something like that but i mean we've had some great people who've won the the uh, all bathtub hall of fame i hear from their families all the time for another pic that we want to see another glimpse of this great statue um, Richard Yates is one. I know Shirley Jackson was one of them. I honestly forget who else we've given this award to because it's so prestigious. And this this month or this year or whatever this is, this this tri-quarterly uh, award, which we give whenever I feel like it, and, and it just I have nothing else to talk about, is this, this month we are going to give it, or this quarter, we're giving it to a surprise writer who everybody will like John Steinbeck. That's right, John Steinbeck. Look at that. It's exciting. The whiteboard's coming out. We do all. I got a purple shirt on. I'm looking. I'm trying to look classy for this episode. And we're going to talk about one of my all-time favorite writers, John Steinbeck. How could he not love Steinbeck? He was great. Everybody enjoys him. You could be 14 years old. I give John Steinbeck books to 12-year-olds, and I give them to 90-year-olds. Everyone likes John Steinbeck, and we're going to talk a little bit about him today. And all I can say is, is there's so many, so many people have w have wasted good bathtub water on John Steinbeck because it's a great pleasure, and 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 it's there's no no redeeming social value. You don't learn anything. He's a great American writer, but you don't learn anything. I promise you, you just have a really good time. He knows how to tell you a story. He knows how to create great characters, and even when he is telling you something important. You don't notice it because you're just kind of wrapped up in the wonderful stuff he writes. So I, I had a reason for it. I'm going to run a, a link to it. I did a review uh, this last week of a new biography called Mad at the World by William Souter, Souter, Souter. It's a recent biography of John Steinbeck. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I like reading about John Steinbeck. And he was an interesting man. And I like him also because he's a, he's a Californian. And that we don't, you know, we don't have too many great California writers who get treated at all well, because California is considered we're, we're considered freaks. Those New York snobs, all those New York snobs, um, they, they, who all give each other awards, they don't want anything to do with the Californians that much. I wanted to mention uh, this because I did enjoy this, but it made me want to go back and I went back and reread one of my favorite literary biographies, which is Jackson J. Benson's biography called "The True Adventures of John Steinbeck, Writer." It's much longer. It's going to take you a lot longer to read. I think I enjoy I enjoy this a lot. It's one of my all-time favorite literary biographies, and it really gets it to the he really gets to the the soul of this guy. He was a very complicated man, and he was I think mad at the world is a good title. He was he was often angry, and he was pissed off about a lot of things, but uh, he, and he didn't really have a huge high higher opinion of of either himself or most human beings, and who can't who can blame him. My God, if he was alive now, I think he would be saying today. So um, this is one I would recommend, but that's another short. It's a shorter one, the Souter biography, and you might want that one. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Akma. Amazon and the Washington Post can kiss my ass. The, the, the Jeff Bezos monstrosities who who uh, treat part-time workers like crap, so he can shove more money in his pockets. And the Washington Post is just as bad as Amazon. So www.bookshop.com. That's one of our favorites here. Online. They're, they're, they're hard. They're, they cost more money than Amazon, but they're worth it. Powell's.com, Skylight Books in L.A. You want a good independent bookshop in your area. And uh, those that's our that's our uh, paid, non-paid, non-political uh, uh, portion of the show. And we'll just leave that Akma thing up there just to, to remind everybody that uh, not to buy Amazon or Washington Post. So I'm not going to say too much uh, too much about Steinbeck, except what I said. He's he's one of the few writers. Young kids get absorbed by him. He's written so many wonderful books. Sometimes I often feel that Steinbeck wasn't taken too seriously by the literary bullshit artists of the world, 
because he wrote a couple of big books. His two most famous big books are The Grapes of Wrath. If you have not read The Grapes of Wrath, you need to go off and get it right away. It's a great, great read. It's very sad. It's very beautiful. It is about a family just being taken apart by just the total corruptions of the agricultural business in, in California, but really the, the business of America, which just takes this poor, poor family apart. It's, it's human. It's sad. It's, if it's uplifting at all, there is a sort of a sense of human kindness that kind of comes out of the book. But basically, um, everybody who does business in this book does what people do today. Akma, they just piss on human beings. And it's, it's a great story. It, you don't, you don't, you, I think you basically know what it has to tell you, but it tells you in a way that is wonderfully well written. His second other large novel, and he was from that period, which I think is kind of, I, one of my big gripes against literary intelligentsia, which I have lots of them, is that books have to be really big to be serious, especially in America. And so East of Eden was a, in the 50s, I believe. It was his second big novel. There's only two big novels, really. It's about two families in, in, the, in the Central Valley, which is where Steinbeck's from. He's from the Salinas area. He came from one of his, his, mo his mother was fairly well off from a big agricultural family. And his father, I believe, was just kind of a petty, bit, small, small civil servant, I think. Or, so I can't remember exactly. But he wasn't as big shot as, as the mother. The mother's family was quite wealthy. And East of Eden is kind of ties up uh, some of these old, uh, um, um, my, hair, my hair looks very strange. My, um, t t there's two different families. There's have some, some autobiographical resonance for Steinbeck. But it's a beautiful book. It's not quite as relentlessly angry as Grapes of Wrath, and there's just some wonderful, beautiful passages. So two great big books of his. But Steinbeck wrote a lot of really short books, and I really do feel that this is really one of the reasons he was unfairly treated. The, actual, the idiot critics would often say, oh, he wrote a little tiny book called Cannery Roar. It's so short, and it's not really this big. It's a lovely comic novel. And, and the themes... They're actually much, they're comic novels. That's another thing that the critics don't like, books that are funny, because they don't have a sense of humor. I'm telling you, most of these characters, Arthur Meisner and all these characters, they didn't, just didn't have a sense of humor. And it, it's a very funny book, and it's really about the pretentious, the pretensions of human beings to do well, that we all try to do well, but we're kind of bad at it. And it's a very funny book about these characters. And then there's good people like Doc, who's based on... Uh, a man Steinbeck loved called Ed Ricketts, who was a, a biologist in, in Monterey. And this is kind of loosely based on that relationship between some of the locals who used to work for Doc Ricketts and uh, um, Ricketts himself, who, uh, who Steinbeck clearly loved all his life. Um, while Hemingway was off, you know, watching bullfights and doing all that bullshit shit in Europe, um, Steinbeck was off. He was a kind of a... He was a, he was a, he was a uh, naturalist. Steinbeck loved the natural world. His book is filled with love for the natural world and uh, observations. And he did a book called The Log from the Sea of Cortez. I haven't read this since I was a kid, but I really remember enjoying it about his relationship with Ricketts and just going out and gathering information uh, of, of natural life. And all of his books, all of Steinbeck's books, are filled with kind of observations of human life as if it's animal life, which it is. I mean, we are, we're filled with all this bullshit, but we're basically animals with all the failures and the aspirations and the uh, um, uh, efforts, some usually fruitless efforts of being an animal in this world. Uh, Long of Cortez is good. A lot of these short novels, I remember enjoying this, is a kind of a parable of, of, of occupation, a Nazi occupation of a small town, or what happens to the the occupiers. This lovely book, Tortilla Flat, his first big book. I'm going to take a sip of my uh, Manhattan and the floral pattern martini glass, just like uh, Philip Marley used to use. In the Big Sleep, you can go see. I'm, I'm absolutely right. It, Philip Marley always drank out of a floral pattern martini glass. Tortilla Flat was one of his early, his first big success. And again, it's very similar to Cannery Row. A bunch of winos and drunks um, in, in Monterey, who are always kind of aspiring to do good things, and they end up getting drunk and, 
and, and trying to get laid. That's basically the joke of almost most of Steinbeck's work. It's it's still a great book. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I, I have not read this, but Jackson Benson, who I, I have a great deal of respect for it from his wonderful biography, considers the journal of a novel that Steinbeck wrote when writing East of Eden to be as good as the novel, which is pretty high praise. And I don't normally like to read journals of novels, but I bought this just last week when I was rereading the Jackson Benson book. And, and if you're interested in writing uh, a writer's reflections on writing books, um, that might actually quite be quite good. Um, most of you know two of the shortest books. You know, if you've got 13, 14-year-old kids who don't like to read and don't like to read serious literature, Of Mice and Men or The Red Pony. Give it, give, I've given this to little kids a lot of times, and they really, they really, really wrap them up. This is a really sad, beautiful book about having affection for an animal, and this is a man feeling affection for another man in the same way, <laughs> in the same way. The kind of human affections between, between animals. I loved, I loved it the first time I read it, and I've read it and enjoyed it several times since. In dubious battle which was before, it's about a union organizer in the, in the Central Valley. I can't remember too well at the moment, except I really enjoyed it. Steinbeck, Steinbeck had a, was basically a leftist, but he had a lot of, he was not entirely, he didn't trust the human, the human animal very much, so he didn't expect that, that the human animal would do well, even when it meant to do well. And that's sort of his, his opinion of, the Marxists and the, and the union organizers as they, they might just try to do well, but they weren't, weren't really going to manage to pull it off usually. It pissed off a lot of the Marxist critics in the 30s and 40s, which is one of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why I think Steinbeck was kind of badly treated as a, as a writer. The Pearl, again, a great, great little fable. I loved it when I read it as a kid. I haven't read it since. Um, one last book I'll talk about. Most people know this, Travels with Charlie. If it's not his last book, it's one of his last books. It was what him as, an, as kind of in his sixties, traveling around America in a kind of big, you know, is like the first RV with his dog Charlie, talking to people, seeing what America looks like, going across the country. You know, he's. I think the story is he only actually spent like thirty or forty days in the actual van. He spent most of the rest of the time in motels and you know, and and going back and forth to home, but. You know, that's, that's the premise of the book. And he writes really well about America, and he has general affection for it and, and, uh, and, and fear for its future. And he was right on both cases. Um, one last thing, the last book I read of his was a book I had not read, an early novel, one of his first few novels called To a God Unknown. It's filled with some of the poetry of landscapes, and he writes really well about the natural world. And it's about a guy, I'm pretty sure, in the first... 20 or 30 pages, who has sex with the actual earth. He actually has sex with the earth. It, it, it's a, it takes pantheism to the ultimate level, and then he ha he, the same man has, he builds his farm there, and he, he loves nature in every possible way, including sexually, and then he has a tree that he thinks his father's in. It's, it's got to be the weirdest Steinbeck book, but I really quite enjoyed it, and it... it uh, it is the most metaphysical of his books. And there is a metaphysical streak in Steinbeck. So anyway, that's our last. We're not, um, I think I'll say this. I've never read it. He, he was a big admirer of the, uh, the, the uh, King Arthur stories, Mallory's Mort to Arthur. And late in life, he wrote his version of the Mort to Arthur, which uh, the publishers, I guess, didn't like. And they hated it when he turned it in. And it was published posthumously. And I've always wanted to read it because he definitely had an affection for this idea of knights errant going out to save the world and pretty much failing miserably. Okay. Great job, John. You're going to you, you and your family, you can you can treasure this just long enough for me to show it to you on the camera then I'm going to have to put it away, save it for our next big uh, big uh, international star of the bathtub. Um, you're you're in good company and you belong there. All Bathtub Hall of Fame, John Steinbeck. Long may you be read. If you're looking for something for your 13-year-old kids or for your 80-year-old grandfather, you can always you always will do well if you pick up a, a good Steinbeck. All right. Happy bathing. More soon.